cervical spine injuries constitute 3 to 4 percent of all trauma patients. The lower cervical fractures constitute 65 percent of all fractures and 75 percent of all dislocations. C6 and C7 fractures account for nearly 40 percent. Spinal cord damage is more frequently associated with the lower than upper cervical spine fractures and have a bimodal peak with the second peak being in people more than 55 years of age. C3 to 7 vertebral bodies constitute the subaxial cervical spine. Uh, they constitute to the major majority of cervical flexion. These are the typical cervical vertebra with the oncovertebral joint and sagittal orientation of the facet joints. The ligamentous anatomy is like that of the other part of the spine. The vertebral artery ascends up in the foramen transverse area. The spinal cord occupies up to 50% of the canal in the uh, lower cervical spine. The treatment starts right at the site of the accident. Um, until the cervical spine evaluation or clearance is done, one should follow strict spine precautions uh, with proper lifting techniques and proper immobilization. Uh, one should initiate the standard trauma resuscitation with the ATLS protocol. The history would include details about pain and the mechanism of injury and the, and the examination would include, uh, among other things, the cervical spine curvature and soft tissue asymmetry. Uh, the neurological evaluation is generally done using the Inski classification. When one looks at the X-ray, one should focus on the spinolaminar line, the posterior vertebral body and the anterior vertebral body lines which are normally unbroken. Uh, in a perfect lateral view, the facet joints are normally appearing like uh, stacked parallelograms and the prevertebral soft tissue shadow, if it is more than 7 mm at C2-3 or more than 21 mm at C6-7 disc, it is strongly suggestive of a cervical spine injury. X-rays, uh, however, are inadequate assessment of the cervicothoracic junction. So at most level 1 trauma centers, CT is routinely used, as was also told by Dr. Carlo Bellabarba. MRI STIR sequence has a high sensitivity for PLC injury, but has a poor specificity as such. Uh, we use the Nexus and Canadian cervical spine criteria for identifying low-risk patients who may not require a radiography after a trauma. And the Canadian C-spine rule has a better diagnostic accuracy. Uh, the Spinal Cord Society of India has come out with various position statements and uh, in the uh, position statement on radiological protocol for cervical uh, trauma, uh, these are some excerpts. In awake CCR high risk or nexus positive patient, CT should be the first line of imaging. Radiographs should be done if CT is unavailable with minimum three and preferably five high quality plane radiographs and MRI is indicated if there is neurological deficit. There are various uh, classifications which have been used for the lower cervical spine. Uh, Holdsworth uh, uh, classified them into five different patterns. Then there was the AO classification as advocated by Magrel, which was not specific for the cervical spine. Then there was the morphological classification, but the Allen and Ferguson classification caught much favor. Uh, the stability in this is based on two column theory and it uses both mechanism and stability to determine the treatment and outcome and uh, divides or classifies uh, the lower cervical spine fractures into six categories. The compressive flexion injuries uh, range from uh, uh, just a mild compression in the stage one to uh, a retrolysthesis of more than 3 mm in stage five. These are various uh, radiological depictions of various stages of compressive flexion injuries. Uh, in the vertical compression, uh, depending on the end plate involvement, involvement, they may be divided into stage 1, 2 and stage 3. Uh, when it comes to teardrop fractures, there could be either extension injuries which are usually benign, but they could be also flexion injuries which are generally unstable and routinely require surgery. So one should be able to clearly uh, distinguish between the two. Compressive extension injuries again uh, are divided into stage one, which is a unilaminar fracture, to stage five, uh, which is a by uh, arc fracture with the total displacement. Distractive flexion injuries are again graded into stage one to stage four, depending on the amount of anterolysthesis. Uh, 
The destructive extension injuries are more common in ankylosing disorders and in degenerative spine. And then you have the lateral flexion injuries which are stage 1 and stage 2 injuries. The slick classification was also proposed by Vaccaro et al. and uh, uses uh, uh, criteria of morphology, discoligamentous complex and neurological status to uh, classify the lower cervical spine fractures. The reliability uh, uh, has been shown to be good both inter-rater and inter, uh, inter intra-rater reliability in studies done by those who have proposed the classification. Uh, however, various other studies have shown that there is no universally accepted classification scheme and experts still feel the need for a better classification system and Alan Ferguson classification is most often used as was also depicted by the study which we did in 2014. In another study which we did in the same year, we compared the Allen Ferguson with the slick system using an international array of spine surgeons and the inter and intra-rater reliabilities were lower than that presented by the developers of the slick system and AF fared much better than slick in our study. So if there is a patient with ankylosing splondylitis with a neck pain or obese patients, poorly imaged patients, distracting injuries or rotational injuries, one must be careful and assess them properly. And also if there is a neurological deterioration which cannot be explained by brain imaging, if there is Horner's syndrome or various other facial fractures or skull based fractures, one should keep one's eye open for a vertebral artery injury as well. it would be the procedure of choice. After evaluation and classification, one should assess on the need for reduction of the fracture by traction and this is a very useful tool as you can see one can easily, uh, especially if there is a bifestal dislocation, one can reduce them within an hour or so uh, if the patient is in within a few hours of the injury. Now the Spinal Cord Society had also come out on position statements on methylprednisolone use and this is just an excerpt where we mentioned that the current evidence does not support the routine administration of methylprednisolone as a standard of care post SCI but this can still be as a treatment option in otherwise healthy patients when treated within 8 hours of the injury. All these position statements are available on the website of Spinal Cord Society and would be published soon in the Journal of Spinal Cord. Uh, with regard to deep vein thrombosis, um, this is less often used in our country. However, in a study which we did in our center, we found that the rates of deep vein thrombosis, even though they may be lower than that in the West, they are still high and we should use this uh, 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 prophylaxis. The best approach is a combination of mechanical and pharmacological thromboprophylaxis uh, using low molecular weight heparin, but oral anticoagulants are an option. Uh, uh, you can initiate a non-operative care using various immobilization techniques. Uh, callers uh, do not provide as good an immobilization, but also with a whole halo there are many complications. Um, and in patients who have a neurological deficit in our countries, it's better to operate them and so that we can mobilize them and uh, put them through a rehabilitation program. And if you need to go in for a surgery, one could go in anteriorly where you address the compression directly. However, uh, you do not have as easy access to the cervicothoracic transition zone. Or you may go posteriorly which provides a more rigid fixation. You can go into the transitional zones but then if there is an anterior compression, you may not be able to relieve it as uh, uh, easily. So uh, the anterior approach is generally used for a burst fracture where there is a disc involvement or significant compression of the anterior column whereas posterior approaches are used for ligamentous injuries, lateral mass fractures or dislocations. And you go in the approach uh, of the interlocal spine fractures and for the compression there is no and the in However, else may go in for a circumference. If there is neurological deficit with the PLC intact, one can just go in for an anterior cervical fixation and fusion, but with the PLC involvement again, one would need to go in for a circumferential fixation. For flexion compression injuries, uh, if the fracture is aligned, one can again manage conservatively, but if, if there is a local kyphosis, one may go in for traction, 
and for non-junctional fractures one may go in for anterior cervical fixation and fusion whereas for junctional fractures or with PLC injury one may need to go in for a circumferential fixation after decompression. For flexion distraction injuries one would initiate with attraction and if reduction is achieved then if the patient is neurologically intact you would have the option of either fixing anteriorly or posteriorly but if the neurology is involved or uh, for or if the it's a junctional fracture one would need to go in for a circumferential uh, fixation if the neurology is worsening with the, uh, 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 after the reduction has been achieved or there is the neurology is involved or if the reduction is not achieved one may need to go in for an MRI and if there is a disc herniation one would need to go in and uh, to do an anterior discectomy first and then attempt an anterior reduction and if it fails go in for a posterior reduction and fixation followed by anterior fusion and fixation but if it is successful one may uh, go in for just an anterior cervical fixation and fusion. In junctional region, circumferential fixation would be required. If there is no disc herniation, one may go straight for a posterior reduction and fixation followed by anterior fusion and fixation per se. In extension distraction injuries, uh, if there is no translation uh, uh, and there is minimum disc opening, one may manage conservatively but if there is a significant disc injury one may need to go in for an anterior cervic cervical discectomy fixation and fusion uh, if there is a transit translational uh, tra if there is translation and if it is uh, not in the junctional region one may need, one may go for an anterior cervical discectomy fusion and fixation now very often in our countries patients come in late and they may come in late with a dislocation but here again traction works very well as you can see in this patient who came in 12 weeks after the injury with traction uh, the dislocation was reduced and one could go in just with an anterior fixation um, uh, and fusion whereas in this patient who came in after 16 weeks uh, which was which could not be reduced by traction one needed to go in for a circumferential head and upper back may need to be supported often by a single posterior approach uh, but because of the osteoporosis and the long lever arm due to the fusion they require multiple strategy was shown to be stronger than using a lateral mass screw at C7 and if you would extend to C6 it would further stiffen the construct. Here you see uh, examples of patients with cervicothoracic fractures fixed posteriorly and this one who was incomplete we did a front back front technique um, thus with the circumferential uh, fixation and decompression as well. Here in the end I would want to emphasize on the need of comprehensive management. We as orthopedic surgeons often tend to look at the fracture only but the management of the vertebral fracture is a tiny component in the comprehensive management of spinal cord injuries and for comprehensive management I would want to introduce these two very useful resources elearnsci.org which is a web resource available free of charge across the globe an ISCOS initiative which has information on management of all components of spinal cord injury management whether it is for a nurse, a therapist, a social worker, psychologist or a doctor and the ISCOS textbook on comprehensive management of spinal cord injuries which Dr. Carlo Bellabarba referred to. So in the end, the take home message, cervical spine injuries are common injuries seen after blunt trauma to the cervical spine. It can lead to potential instability and catastrophic neurological deficit. Prompt evaluation and treatment is important. Stable fractures can be treated non-operatively whereas unstable ones re require surgical treatment. Realignment, stabilization of the spine and neurological decompression is of utmost importance but equally if not more important is the comprehensive management of spinal cord injuries. So, thoracic fractures are commonly missed and need to be ruled out. The